Hello YouTube, Liverpool fan in Japan here, the Miyazaki Man Sai. This will hopefully be the last video that I shoot in this particular location because as you can see a sneak peek behind me, the studio is almost set up, we're almost there folks. Hang in there, we're going big baby. Until then, a transfer, a football transfer to be precise. How difficult is it? Very, very difficult for many reasons. We're going to talk about how hard a football transfer actually is and why a swap deal almost never happens. Are we finally going to sign Marco Royce? I had the Ryan Babblecopters ready for Samal Sabrosa. Yevon Konoplyanka's on Merseyside? And Nelko Morientes. Stuart Downing or in Zogbia? He's got to go with the English factor, right, apparently? Let's get into it. But just before we do, I want to announce that YouTube memberships for Liverpool Fan in Japan channel are now open. If you want to go further in supporting this channel, then membership is the best way to do it. I'm going to give you unfiltered, uncensored early previews of videos, including my personal thoughts on other content creators. Wataru Endo also has over a hundred exclusive videos on a video log series in Japanese. I'm going to go through them one by one, review them, tell you what they're all about initially. Member shout outs to you guys. I'm commission some custom art to send you guys Christmas cards as well. I plan to do some live shows as well in the UK when I'm back there. London, Liverpool, I'll hit them all up. Priority invites to those nights out with the Miyazaki man. Looking forward to see you guys too. Do some monthly member Q&As as well. Any question you want about football or you want answered, also about personal life, about Japan, whatever you want, let me know. We'll do a full Q&A video and I'll release it publicly at the end of the month as well. And also help me shape the channel because you can give me the ideas of videos that you want seen and I'll try my best to fulfill each and every one throughout the year. I'll give you a full review of Wataru Endo's dual book, which is an excellent book, not just on football, but on life philosophies as well and achieving all your goals and ambitions. And there's even a tier for 15 minute one-to-one -one conversation of yours truly. If you want to chat with me about life, universe, everything and football analysis, we can even upload it if it's good banter, right? And I will do a dedicated video on what membership means to everyone. But once again, it's purely optional if you want to go above and beyond in supporting this channel. A like and comment goes a long way to helping support me and makes me happy. Thank you. First and foremost, obviously clubs like Liverpool and every other Premier League club, every other club in the world will have identified their transfer targets long ago, drawn up a short list of potential players for each position and they would have gone through many, many metrics. I've made a dedicated video on identifying the prospects, the people who fit the particular persona, the attributes and the role that you're looking for. Every single club has a different approach to transfers. But with Liverpool, we have that transfer committee, Michael Edwards, Julian Ward, Richard Hughes, all in it together alongside FSG and the manager, Arne Slot. Arne Slot will have ideas of what kind of player he wants and it'll be up to the team, the infrastructure and the backroom committee to make sure that we have the best possible chance of landing that player. And to land that player, they've got to work in unison, work in perfect harmony, almost like this delicious Jogger Bonito cake I bought from Benito Cakes. Look, it's topped by some shiny, white, rounded, bold looking shoe cream, just like Liverpool with Arne Slot. Underneath it, built on solid foundations, it looks like some kind of folded crepe pancake thing. I'm not actually sure what's in there, but um, there's only one way to find out. Goodness. <laughs> that full shoe cream. Here we go. We've nailed every transfer target, like custard, sponge, oh. So I digress. Now, first and foremost, the obvious, transfer fees. You've got to be able to afford the transfer fee that you discuss with the opposition club. The rival club has no real incentive to sell the player unless they want to sell that player and get rid of that player. And you have to negotiate with them an appropriate transfer fee that you can afford, paid in installments that are affordable to you and suitable to the opposition club as well. Obviously, if there's a release clause, you have to pay a lump sum and there's no bargaining in question. You pay the release clause and then you have the option to negotiate with the player. Sometimes the release clause can be negotiated in terms of, okay, we'll pay the release clause perhaps in installments and pay a little bit above and beyond the release clause so that we can spread the cost of payments to meet financial fair play or any other accounting kind of metric that you're trying to meet as well. Okay, obvious. Wage budget as well. So you have to agree a wage package with the player in question as well. Obviously, most players are looking for a bump in wages to move clubs. But then again, some players who are on a hefty, hefty sum, I'm thinking a lot of players at Manchester United, might even leave on reduced fees. But however, they're looking to make up that downfall in basic wage in perhaps clauses or perhaps the parent club, Manchester United, will continue paying a subset of that wage to meet the remainder of the contract, for example, Casemiro on a huge wedge, Rafa Varane, if you were sold at the time, that kind of thing, right? Um, I think transfer fees and wage fees represent the biggest chunk of financial outlay that you need for any given transfer. However, you've got to look at the bigger picture as well. It's not just the base pay in terms of wages and transfer fees. You've got other fees involved as well, especially agents, okay? So let's talk about agents specifically. You have to approach the agent and the parent club before you can even talk to the player. You can't directly go to the player. That's a complete 
no, no, you might be done in for that. And the opposition rival club won't look kind on that and he may even report you. Hence, the Van Dijk transfer delayed for six months because apparently we talked to him in Blackpool. But the age of tapping up is a little bit over, I would say, because many a time the club give you permission to talk to the player to gauge their interest, see whether they're interested in going, see if you can come up with a suitable remuneration package, i.e. the wage, the clauses, etc. We'll go into clauses in a second, around enticing the player to join your club. So you might have permission from the club already or through intermediaries, through agents, right? There's no rules around putting that third party middle person just to negotiate on your behalf to get the feelers out there to see if they're even interested in whether it's worth pursuing that player for your particular club, see whether they're interested in it, okay? Let's say you've got permission from the club to talk to the player, to talk to the agent, you might have them in a room at the same time alongside lawyers and whoever else. You've got to sell the vision to that player. There might be some players, for example, who jump at the opportunity to jump at, to Liverpool FC. But others may be in high demand. They might have Bayern Munich, Liverpool, Real Madrid, for example, chasing them. And you've got to convince them of their particular role in Liverpool, in your squad, in the playing squad for next season. Will they have a key role? Will they grow as the season goes on and get used to the, the training after a hefty pre-season hopefully they adapt to the tactics of Arnie Slot and therefore slot in the team very quickly or will they be behind a player at the first string 11 and there'll be the next option coming off the bench and if they show form or there's an injury they'll be the first player coming in or are they purely a rotational option or are they youth player developing would they not even be part of the first 11 to begin with there's many many discussions to be had convincing the player of what their particular role will be next season and you have to stay to it as well because because players are humans, right? You make promises to them around playing time, about position, about utilization. You gotta keep it, otherwise they'll be disgruntled and dismayed and probably demotivated, right? Fabio Carvalho, for example, was sold on the pretenses. Apparently he would have played a number 10 position. We would have changed the formation for him. Don't know where that came from. However, there was no real position for Fabio Carvalho. His minutes were less and less as the season wore on. A loan was obvious and he's, real he's rebuilt himself after the Leipzig loan. Now at Hull with Tyler Morton, right? Coming back, he's got a chance to impress Arne Slot in pre-season. Hope that goes well. Fingers crossed for you, Fabio, my friend. And then how long are you willing to hold out for a player, a generational player like Jude Bellingham, for example, who intimated his interest in joining Liverpool or Real Madrid? You're probably committing 90, 95% of your transfer budget, your wage budget, to getting him in. He probably wants to wait till the last day of the transfer window. How long do you wait until you move on to target two? And also identifying critical positions. Do you go all in on that generational talent and bring a young gun afterwards? Or do you go down the list further? We need a defensive midfielder, we need a left back, we need a right winger, a striker, etc. That kind of thing. How do you divvy up your wage budget, your transfer budget, when a player is holding on to all the marbles, all the dice, and non-committal, maybe perhaps using you to renegotiate his contract with his current club, a la Alan Shearer, when Julio was after him in the last years, we needed a, a striker who could bang in a goal or two, and Shearer renewed with Newcastle. Figo had between Liverpool and Inter Milan, and to Inter Milan, for example. They may be renewing or using your interest, or putting Liverpool's name out there, for their own interest, either renewing the contract, getting a better contract, or actually prompting a rival club to make the offer to that player so you can sign that player that kind of thing right so it's a very very edgy dicey game that you can't put all your eggs in one basket you have to have contingency plans and if your number one target falls through do you go to the number two target in that position or do you therefore prioritize other positions we'll get into a player who we almost signed and thank the lord we didn't sign him the deal fell through and then we signed one of the best goalkeepers ever baby <laughs> Alison posh that header got us champions league and then you look at the intangibles, the, the kind of personal side of things and the relationships, his family. Will the family acclimatise to Liverpool? Will they acclimatise to the UK if they aren't here already? The UK, where the English, can the player and their family speak English? Will they want to relocate and settle in Merseyside? Nurseries, schools, universities, all that kind of thing, right? The lifestyle of the UK, can they find an appropriate family home? privacy or party life or whatever they want a lot of families for example and players are drawn to london unfortunately so tottenham chelsea arsenal have the pick of the bunch if the location is very important obviously players who are already rooted in london may not want to move out of london for example so that plays a part of it as well these are all considerations when you approach a player or your rival a london club for a player how big is the pool of london how big is the pool of london sized wages those clubs pay extortion amounts for example Arsenal pay very very high fees you saw the fee they paid for Declan Rice and you saw the wage they paid Declan Rice as well it was a non-competitive market even Manchester City balked at that financial might they had a few painful years at Emirates but now it's coming up trumps and they seem to be able to back Arteta so their financial strategy after a long 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 period seems to be working out well for them and then players have to think of the future as well do they see Liverpool as a final destination because 
The club you join next really puts a bearing on what you can do in the future. Liverpool, you may be able to get to a Barcelona. You may be able to get to a Real Madrid if you convince them and they had financial might and they really, really want you. But you're never going to go to a Manchester United. You're very likely not going to go to an Everton, for example. So if Everton, for whatever reason, or Manchester United is that player's boyhood club or dream club, then you can't go to Liverpool because you're very unlikely to go there unless your name's Michael Owen, in which case somehow you end up there and you don't care about your reputation. It's all about it's all about mo 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 Michael Owen. <laughs> ah, kid, he's a Ballon d'Or winner. Wonder kid at Liverpool. He he was a great servant, done great things here, but unfortunately, um, minimal fee to Real Madrid. We had Cisse and Milan Barros coming up as top scorer from the Euros as well. Florence Cinema Pongo, high, young, talented kid. Neil Mellet in that season as well. We were short shrift by, by Michael Owen. We really didn't get a good fee. We actually wanted one Fran and that 10 million for Michael Owen, but they wouldn't even give us one Fran, which was a um, prospect at the time. And we ended up with Antonio Nunes, a video on Nunes coming soon, and the unsung heroes of the Istanbul journey, because actually it was his header that was saved and Mellet followed up by to get it in against Olympiacos. But yeah, I digress just a little bit. So the future club that they're aspiring to get to, the future stage, whether it's a Premier League or you know Champions League club or whatever, the next step of, not really a stepping stone, but the next club that they join has a big bearing on their future prospects. Because for example, if they are highly regarded, their prospect, their wonder kid, and they don't get much playing time or they don't really perform well at a club, their stock goes way down, reputation goes way down. So they might need to make a horizontal lateral movement or even a league below. However, if they, for example, build their career up at an appropriate place like Southampton, for example, Sadio Mane to Southampton, and then you go from a then you go from a Southampton to a Liverpool, that is the ideal stage because you've proven your worth in the Premier League. You can adapt to the UK, and this is why clubs like Liverpool like to see South American players, African players, players from another league adapt to the Premier League with a lower club and then spend the big bucks, maybe double the transfer fee that they initially went to that club for because it's more of a known quantity. And when you're at a club like Liverpool, you can't take the risks to bring them through. You can't give them the playing time that a Southampton can, can give them. They also learn a perspective under a different manager, a different setup, different training regime, right? Picking up the English language as they go along, learning more experience, getting used to the Premier League, the hustle and bustle, the physicality, the speed, for example. So that's what you pay the extra for. You pay the extra margin for that reassurance, that guarantee, because as I mentioned, when you are in the Liverpool hot seat, a Manchester United hot seat, a Man City hot seat, time is not your friend, results are everything, you have to have a known quantity even if you pay above and beyond the asking price at the time, right? Certain clubs like a Manchester City, couldn't Aguero at the time, you can take a risk on them because you have X striker, X amount of strikers, two strikers, three strikers, and if they don't work, you chip them out, you can get another striker. Or like Chelsea, loan them somewhere else until you can transfer them, get them off your books, amortize the transfer fee for that particular season and balance the books iffy way of doing it but clubs like Liverpool we can't take the punt we have to be sure sure that we're going to get it right at least 90% of the time and this is why Michael Edwards, Julian Ward and Richard Hughes coming in is so so important with that infrastructure there and then backing each other's decision making and having a lot of prominent figures royal respected figures high IQ figures coming to the same decision in a linear line of thought hopefully we'll make the right decisions and this transfer window will prove it fingers crossed and then we come to clauses. Clauses is very important as well, right? Is it a sell-on clause, for example, in terms of the player coming here, which makes it harder for buying clubs to get you out of that club because I'm going to want a certain return on my investment above and beyond the 10% I need to give to your former club, to the feeder club before. Additionally, other clauses such as goal bonus, such as assist bonus, they kind of incentivize the player to do particular actions. So do you want your striker to be super selfish with no assist bonus and a super high goal bonus, in which case he's shooting on site even if there's a better placed person, right? Or do you incentivize them to do assists as well as goals, etc.? Maybe you put assists higher because they always like to score a goal for personal glory. It's your ego inside yourself. But they've got that high incentive financial value to get the assist as well. So you've got to balance out these clauses very, very carefully. Also in terms of relegation clauses, minimum release clauses, you've got to think carefully about the clauses in the contract because the contract is probably pages and pages long of various clauses of various substantial differences to what you as a player get, what the agent gets for example. I think clauses are the biggest reason why transfers are held up as well. Things like media rights, right? How much of your own image rights do you retain? How much of your media rights do you retain? What are your media responsibilities? What are your responsibilities to the club? 
And that's why the role of an agent is very, very important because they get down to the nitty gritty, the granular detail and make sure the contract is fit for purpose for the player that they're representing as well as the club that they represent. There's a haggle and compromise that always needs to happen before you sign the contract. And then the stipulations as well, such as minimum amount of playing time and clauses that activate after certain thresholds are met. After you've played a certain amount of games, you agree that transfer with the rival club, you have to buy them. After a certain amount of games, you have to pay them an extra £5 million pounds upon Champions League qualification or winning the Premier League or winning the Ballon d'Or. You have to commit a certain amount of finance as promised, as stated in the clauses to that club or to the player themselves. And then think about it, you as a player going to work, waking up, meeting your colleagues, meeting the team, certain players like the environment that they're going to train in. So the acts of training ground, world class facilities, do they have a gym, do they have training pitches, do they have state of the art technology, what are the coaches like, what is the coaching method of the manager, is he going to run you down to the ground, is he going to burn you out, is he absolute taskmaster, is he easy going and chillax like Carlo Ancelotti, Don Carlo. It makes a big difference because that is your work. No matter what people think about world football, they have to go in each and every day and make friends with these people, build relationships. You have to get on well with your colleagues and Liverpool has a great changing room, right? Full of characters, full of smiles and joy, even series like Wingmen, for example. And behind the scenes, Liverpool is the place to be. Come on, big players. You know you want to get to the Axe Training Ground. So it really makes a big difference. Does the club have world-class facilities? Is the training my type of training? Is the weather going to be decent in my day-to-day -day training as well? Do we have South American compatriots who can speak the language in case I don't understand Thiago Alcantara explaining to Darwin Nunes when he's coming on, for example? And above and beyond that, what is the injury record like at this particular club? Are they going to run me down to the ground? Are they going to wear out my tendons, my meniscus, my knees? Am I going to get hamstring injuries? What is the physiotherapy room like? How does the club treat injury-prone players? How, how likely am I going to be forced back into action before I recuperate? Additionally, what is the fans' perspective of players? Do they back the players come what may? Do they turn on the players very, very quickly? Are they likely to give you a chance, a second chance, chant your name, make a song for you? How are they going to respond to me as a player? Will it take like a fish to water if I take time if I'm a slow burner and come into my prime in the second season? The fans, historically, of a club will make a big difference in the transfer decision of the players themselves because nobody wants to be booed and be the pantomime villain week in, week out, right? And then things like the timing is very important as well. So Javi Alonso, it's not his time to leave Leverkusen. He's just getting started there. He's won the Bundesliga in an undefeated season. He lost the Europa League final final however he won the cup as well so it's a double it's an undefeated season it's not his time to move certain players might be feeling they're getting to their pomp getting the rhythm really acclimatizing to the club they're currently at and need to give it a season more to develop work on a weakness work under particular coaches training methods get a higher package for themselves if they can consistently prove they can score above 20 goals it wasn't just a fluke one-off season they may be backing themselves to get a bigger package or move to a better club in the future Luis Suarez that 40 million plus one pound what were they smoking over there at the Emirates he held out on the advice of Steven Gerrard but he actually wanted to go to Arsenal I don't know why he wanted to go there and he eventually got his move to Barcelona. Also, a bit bitter about that. Suarez, what a talent. But yeah, biting people to make his move is what it is, right? History is in the past. Sometimes the timing isn't right for a player. Perhaps your kid just made a best friend at the school, really, and joined a new class. Your wife has settled there, found a gym class, a yoga class, or something they're really, really looking forward to. Or yourself, you really, really established a good partnership, a strike partnership, a midfield partnership, defensive partnership with a team or the team might have a chance at Champions League next season or they've been promised a big big signing or you know a signing already a pre-contract's done and they're coming in and can help bolster your season perhaps the timing isn't right for the player for personal or professional reasons the timing is also a very very important part of transfers and no matter how much a transfer looks perfect and dead on the Bill Fakir for example until the final minute even done the recorded media footage of him signing for Liverpool until his brother came in last moment and said, no, I want an extra million, mate, extra two million. I'm, I'm a Fakir's bro, mate. you got to pay me or we ain't going there. And that's all right, son, because you can go to Real Betis and we'll get Alison Becker signed straight after the deal fell through. And even when you agree a lot of the clauses, agree the transfer, agree the potential wages that the player might want, nothing happens until it's signed, sealed and delivered on the dotted line. Because a player might back up like Caicedo, obviously, kept his word to Chelsea, wanted that wage packet, that hefty chunk. I don't know whether it was an honourable thing to keep his word or he was promised things or a bit of backhands behind the scenes. Who knows? Liverpool 
bid over 100 million. But in the end, we got Wataru Endo, Man Mountain, Big E. Good things happen to those who wait. We ended up with a better deal, I would say, value for money as well, especially he's a thinking man player. You'll see very, very soon. I've actually got huge, a huge content library of Wataru Endo. He's got his own personal repertoire of video content on life lessons and football lessons and his experience in Liverpool in Japanese and I'm going to be translating them in the member section coming very very soon so thank you so much for supporting make sure you smash the like on this video it really really helps me out the next video is going to be in the studio I'm prepping it now should be ready very very soon the desk only arrived today the lights need a bit of fine tuning as well I'm getting the audio synced and working well as well so thank you very much so now you see so many difficulties in concluding a transfer and even when you concluded a transfer and sometimes sometimes tragedy happens as well i seem to remember john obi mikel signed for man united and then went back on the deal to go for chelsea and chelsea agreed to pay compensation to man united to allow john obi mikel to break the contract to sign for chelsea there's odd things like that and then there's odd things such as you can only be registered for two clubs and play for two clubs. So even if you sign another contract with another club, you can't actually play for that club, which makes it absolutely nonsensical to do it in the first place. And then there's other things like work permits. You can sign everything up to a point waiting for an international permit to allow them to play in Europe or play in a Premier League, for example. And then there might even be tragedy like Emiliano Sala. Real commiserations. That was a real, real sad event. But obviously you never know what can happen in life. So even when it's signed, signed, sealed and delivered, you just don't know. You just don't know. And with all these things in mind, this is why it makes it so difficult to do a straight swap transfer. People talk about, for example, Luis Diaz to Barcelona, perhaps Rafinha to Liverpool, right? Think of all the different permutations, everything I've talked about that has to be agreed between so many parties. So many things have to be signed off, ticked, sealed and delivered until that point where they cross over right and you've got to register the player with the local league as well making sure all the paperwork is in place in time before the transfer deadline because that has scuppered many a deal unless you do that last minute signature thing to extend it beyond the window or whatever i don't know it gets very confusing at that point so even with swap deals it's usually more common for each of those transfers to be done irrespective of each other separately so one can be concluded and the other one can be concluded separately in case something falls through at least one way still happens but there might be contingency that if one way falls through they both fall through anyway so more or less it's the same thing right um you do get some historic transfer trades in the past ibrahimovic samuel eto for example was it inter milan and barcelona where they paid an additional amount of money plus samuel eto for ibrahimovic who never fit into barcelona because messi decided that he wanted that central role which meant ibrahimovic was on the fringes yeah, I feel sorry for him in that particular regard, but his career turned out all right, right? And Samuel Eto went to Inter Milan and absolutely flourished there. Was he under Mourinho? I seem to remember Mourinho, Diego Melito. Was it a triple winning season? Can't remember, something like that. Um, so yeah, transfers are very, very difficult. So as much as it's fun to say, let's sign X and let's sign Y and off they go to Liverpool. Here we go, Fabrizio Romano kind of thing, right? Nothing's really, really finalised until you see them holding the shirt and it's publicized and announced by the club. The club have the ultimate final announcement, even if the player announces it, even if the player wears your shirt. Like, do you remember Piotr Zielinski? Zielinski at Napoli really wanted to go to Liverpool. He even had a Liverpool shirt with him and ultimately he signed for Napoli. And with Fakir's training footage, his montage, his introduction to Liverpool, all filmed, the media all done already, official Liverpool media all filmed and edited and ready to go. And falling through the last minute, at the end of the day, transfers are difficult. So give huge credit to all those involved in transfers, no matter the agents, no matter the fees, no matter extorting clubs or the players' wage demands or anything like that. When a transfer actually happens, a lot of work has gone into it. So be appreciative of every transfer to Liverpool conclude. And with that being said, hurry up Liverpool, conclude some transfers. Can't wait. Silly season's coming up. Here's Akiman Ichiban. The next videos will be shot in the studio. Here we go. Till next time, Janet.